Hello and welcome to my talk. My name is Volker Röber. I'm in charge of the chair HPC Waves at the University of Po in Southwest France. Today I'd like to show you one of our studies, a multi-scale infragravity wave study along the French Basque Coast. This work was mainly conducted by one of the master students in our coastal engineering program, Bill Nestler. In the background you can see a picture of the Côte Basque, which is a 30 km long intensive use coastline. It's full of rocky shores, sandy embayments and cliffs. The maritime activities are quite intense, a lot of tourism, a lot of surfing industry, fisheries. The area is very exposed to energetic waves and coastal flooding, especially during the winter time, is a common problem. So the objective of the study is actually to get a brief overview and a conceptual overlook of the wave processes that govern the French bus coast. We focus here on sea swell and infragravity wave variability, and we'd like to understand the physical processes that actually lead to the generation and dissipation of infragravity waves on a large scale. To do that, we utilize a phase-resolving numerical model to compute these processes. In this example, we use the BOSS model, which is a business type model developed within the chair. The model has been extensively validated and verified with experiments and benchmarked in multiple studies. So we're not looking at a particular benchmarking efforts for this particular study, we're just using the model in the best way possible to derive data from it and then analyze the data to derive results. The numer numerical domain is 20 kilometers by eight kilometers with a grid size of five meters. This results in a relatively large numerical domain of 6.5 million cells. We orient the domain about parallel to the coast in order to save computational effort. We use the uniform friction factor based on Manning roughness. Um, and offshore depth is limited to 50 meters to the support dispersion. This requires slight alteration of the bathymetry, as you can see in the right picture. There are two, num two notable bathymetric features. One is a sediment deposit from dredging activity in the northern part of the domain, and the other one is a long diagonally running rock formation between 20 and 30 meter depth. What we would like to do is here to compute a typical swell scenario rather than an extreme event. So we look at the long time series record from a wave buoy in the area and identify a typical swell of 3.5 meter significant wave height, 15 second peak period and 350 degrees direction. We recompute this event in SWAN to just obtain 15 individual spectra along the offshore boundary of the numeric domain. We extract them from the 50 meter contour and then translate them to the offshore boundary in BOSS to be able to compute a variable wave maker energy at 50 meter depth. Important for phase resolving models is to ensure that we're computing the dispersion properties correctly. In this case, it is very important to truncate an offshore spectrum to a wave of about 100 meters, which corresponds to twice the depth in this particular example. This is easily possible because the wave energy contained in high frequencies is minor and the overall component components of the swell spectrum are maintained. We now examine the influence of three components. First, the water level, then the wave in direction, and also the swell intensity. We then derive with several statistical methods results in terms of power spectral density, energy flux, cross correlation, and runup. So we're just looking at the reference run one, which is the mean sea level scenario, and we divide the significant wave height into a swell band and an infragravity band. We can already see that the symmetry is a driving factor of causing hot spots and also cold spots in both infragravity and gravity swell. The decrease of swell wave energy at the breaking point in about five meter water depth. Um, also leads to an increase in infragravity waves near shore. It's also noticeable that infragravity waves are not only confined to the shoreline and the surf zone, but also can be found in water depths between 20 and 40 meter far offshore. Most of the infragravity energy is in the short IG band between half a minute and one minute. It's concentration in the surf zone, but it's highly variable, and that's where numerical computation comes in handy. It's also possible that a standing wave has occurred in the one to two and the two to three minute band. When we look at energy flux and dissipation, dissipation is the horizontal spatial gradient of the energy flux. We can see the flux is greatest 
with infragravity significant wave finds at the highest. There's an increase towards the shore due to shoaling of the group waves and the decrease around the five meter contour from the breakpoint on. The dissipation is actually not always gradual. It's in some areas more abrupt than in others, and this depends mostly on the breaking intensity of the local bathymetry. For coastal engineers, significant swash heights and run-ups are very important. And we found that the infragravity component of the swash is by far larger than the gravity component. And this is actually also extremely variable along the shoreline. It's more uniform in the northern part where the beach is sandy and straight and less irregular and more noisy in the southern part where we have cliff coasts. Cross correlations are a good measure of similarity of two waves. In this case, we use the infragravity wave in relation to the sea swell envelope at different time lag positions. In the open ocean, infragravity waves are bound to the wave group and face locked, and this would be indicated with a negative cross correlation. In contrast, a positive cross correlation would mean an in phase component or an out of phase infragravity wave. Also, quite informative to use this method to find out whether the bound wave or the breakpoint mechanism are dominant in the generation of infragravity waves. When we just look at the cross correlation at zero second time lag, it's pretty evident that in the offshore area, almost all the infragravity wave energy is bound to the group waves. It's not very surprising, it's very common. And then after the breakpoint, infragravity waves become free and the cross correlation becomes positive. And it's also visible, and that's actually quite particular particular interest to this area is that areas with large infragravity wave energy have high correlation values. This means that the infragravity waves, waves are driven by the wave group shoaling and forcing in the initial area and the concentration around the underwater bathymetric features. And zones of high swell intensity also means zones of high infragravity waves. So now we look at cross correlations with a time lag. And in this case, we look at two different profiles, one in the northern part of the domain, La Bar, and the other one in the center part at Cote de Basque. And we're using here a plus minus 30 second time lag, which corresponds more or less to the boundary between infragravity and gravity waves. We find that the strongest cross correlations are visible for about 15 second time lag. And this indicates about that the infragravity wave bound to the wave group is lagging behind by about one peak period. It is difficult to find out what mechanism is predominant for the generation of infragravity. So here we take a transit of Bidar, which is an example. Other locations behave very similarly. Bidar is in the center point of the domain. And we find that there is negative cross correlations offshore of the breakpoint. It's also not surprising, we've seen this before. Most of the infragravity waves comes in with the bound wave of the wave groups. There's the bound wave mechanism. Then the signal becomes positive after the breakpoint, which indicates that there is some breakpoint mechanism responsible for additional generation of infragravity waves. But when we compare the overall magnitudes, we can see that the magnitude from the shoaling incoming group wave is actually larger than the infragravity wave growth after breaking. So we conclude that the breakpoint mechanism is not very predominant and that is rather the bound wave mechanism that is generating a good portion of the infragravity waves along many locations of the code bus. So in summary, <coughs> When we look at reference one for mean sea level, we found that swell wave energy hotspots occur basically at these underwater rock formations, zones of high refraction, such as the depot near the Abdur river mouth and other features where refraction is dominant. For infragravity waves, we can also say that the symmetry has a high influence on concentrating them. The greatest infragravity wave heights and IG energy fluxes are landward of the zones of high refraction. Dissipation of infragravity waves is mostly happening within the surf zone together with gravity waves. We also have found that the infragravity swash oscillations are by far dominating the irregular swell wave oscillations in the swash zone. So what does the water level change to the whole system? Here we use two different scenarios, plus and minus, Two meters. For a high tide scenario, which is plus two meters, you can see that the waves break further onshore where the beach is steeper. This means there's a shorter surf zone and certainly less dissipation. 
And this changes basically the infragravity waves by 10 to 20 centimeters. But it's of particular interest for spring tide and sea level rise scenarios because the runup is dominated by infragravity waves. So less dissipation of infragravity waves at high tide stages is quite a problem for this area of the shore. The wave direction has actually minimal changes to the offshore significant wave order of infragravity waves, but we can see that a change of the direction shifts or translates infragravity wave hotspots to the south and to the north, depending on the swell direction. For a more southerly approach, the infragravity wave decreases everywhere except in Anglet. And there's a stronger concentration around the depot at a more southwesterly swell direction and vice versa. The wave intensity certainly has also a strong impact on the infragravity waves. Here we use a scenario by, by decreasing the energy by 50%, but this decreases actually the infragravity wave by 75%. So there's a strong nonlinearity between swell heights and resulting infragravity waves, especially at wave focusing formations and in the wave breaking zone. So to conclude, you can see that here at the Code Basque, the bathymetry influences infragravity wave development and location. There are strong hot, hot spots in gravity and infragravity waves, mostly due to zones of high refraction. The run-up, and it's very important, is highly dominated by infragravity waves. And this is particularly a problem with sea level rise and large swell events, because the high, infragravity increases non-linearly with changes in wave height and water level. Changes in wave direction mostly changes the location of the infragravity hotspots alongshore. And infragravity waves and swash heights are more sensitive to changes in the water level and swell intensity than they are to the swell direction. We've also found that the bound wave mechanism is dominant for this area of the, of the Atlantic for the IG wave generation. I thank you for your attention. In case you have questions or comments, or if you're interested in our Coastal Engineering Master Program, please drop me an email or check out the following websites. Thank you very much.